From their earliest childhood, expressions such as race and national socialism or cremation resonated in their homes. The greeting, Heil mein Führer, it even became his morning greeting on some occasions, and for many, they were his first words. The children of the main Nazi leaders grew up immersed in the military doctrine and principles of the Third Reich, always isolated from outside reality, captives of an anti-Semitic and monstrous regime. In today's video, we are going to share with you the stories of the descendants of some of the most important figures in Germany during World War II. We will try to explore what the life and upbringing of a group of children who used to call the fearsome German Fuhrer Uncle Adolf was like, welcome once again to military history. Until the dramatic end of World War II, Adolf Hitler's private residence served as the epicenter of the most crucial meetings of the fervent Nazi party. However, he not only received dignitaries and senior officials for political reasons, but more relaxed meetings were held that revealed the more human side of the Führer. These moments were usually organized by Eva Braun, his wife, known only to the tyrant's inner circle. Among these evenings, the most recurrent were those with the visit of the Schneider couple, Erwin and Hertha Schneider. These two were regular figures every week at the gatherings at the Berghof, the Führer's second government residence and resting place. Hertha, a close friend of Eva Braun since childhood, maintained an indestructible trust and loyalty with her. The Schneiders fit perfectly with the National Socialist vision of Hitler and Brown, forming a family that many aspired to emulate. Wherever they went, they took with them two little girls whom they presented as their daughters. The eldest, named Ursula, but known simply as Ushi, used to run around the wide terraces of the Berghof, even mingling among important visitors who arrived to discuss official matters with the Fuhr. The relationship between little Ursula and the Hitler couple drew powerful attention. To understand this story, we must go back to 1938, when Eva Braun took one of her trips through Europe, specifically to Italy. It is speculated that, on that trip, the woman was supposedly pregnant by the Fuhrer, and she secretly gave birth to Ursula. By prior agreement, the girl was registered with the surname Schneider to be cared for by this friendly couple with the purpose of preserving her from the dangers associated with her being the Fuhrer's daughter. Furthermore, the plan sought at that time to keep Hitler's relationship with Eva Braun hidden and to demonstrate that he was only married to his beloved nation. In the photographs and filming of Hitler and Ursula, a special relationship was revealed that raised suspicions. In all the captured images, you can see a less rigid and more human Hitler. It is speculated that only the little girl was capable of awakening that apparently non-existent facet of his personality. Eva Braun was the one who recorded the majority of these images, showing the duo in family scenes, meetings with friends, and playing with SS agents near the Alpine residence. With the defeat of Germany and the subsequent side of Eva Braun and Hitler, the trace of the little girl was lost but the most skeptical held the conspiracy theory that Ursula was indeed the daughter of the most powerful couple in Nazi Germany. However, specialist historians maintain that the hypothesis is nothing more than a conjecture and that Adolf Hitler left no descendants in this world. The one who did father creatures was Heinrich Himmler, one of the most sinister characters in history. He was the commander-in-chief of the SS and one of the most prominent Nazi leaders. His macabre fame is largely attributed to his role as the chief architect of the Holocaust, being responsible for the creation and oversight of the concentration camp system. However, Himmler's dark shadow extends even beyond his own life, revealing a surprising secret through his daughter, Gudrun Burwitz. Born on August 8, 1929, Gudrun was shaped from childhood by Nazi ideals. The image of her, even as a child, was used as propaganda by fitting into the concept of the Aryan race. Testimonies from prisoners claimed to have seen her walking through concentration camps with her father. However, 
Everything changed drastically in 1945, when the world she knew fell apart the moment the Nazis lost the war. After Himmler's suicide at the end of World War II, Gudrun had to testify at the Nuremberg trials. Released in 1946 after her statement, this fervent follower of Nazism decided to alter her father's perception. I want to try to change his image, she stated in the only interview she gave. From adorable little girl to Nazi fanatic, Gudrun Berwitz played a leading role in Stille Hilfe, a secret organization that provided support to former Nazi members, fugitives, convicts, and their families. This entity, to this day, remains one of the most controversial organizations in post-war Germany. Gudrun died in May 2018 at the age of 88, adopting her husband's surname to avoid the social condemnation linked to her father's. Recognized in Germany as a fervent supporter of neo-fascist ideology, her far-right thinking earned her the title Nazi Princess. However, after his death, an unknown fact about his life was revealed. During the 60s, he worked in the Federal Intelligence Service, leaking information for American spies, a facet of his existence that he kept secret to avoid the accusation of betrayal by his Nazi friends. Another Nazi father was Joseph Goebbels, the master of propaganda and central figure of the Third Reich. Born in 1897, Goebbels emerged as one of Adolf Hitler's closest collaborators, playing a crucial role in promoting and consolidating the regime. With his eloquence and ability to manipulate the masses through the media, Goebbels became the architect of the Nazi propaganda machine. Part of this was to generate a family model for which the Nazi hierarchs competed, as we see in this fragment. <laughs> His wife, Magda Goebbels, was considered the queen of the Third Reich. In this woman's body, everything that the German totalitarian system expected from a wife and mother was condensed. A devotion to caring for a husband dedicated to the growth of the nation and to raising the little ones who were going to become the superior race. A devoted fanatic of the Nazi cause and her Führer, Magda was willing to take her Aryan way of seeing the world with her husband to the ultimate consequences. It was for this reason that the defeat in 1945 led to a catastrophe for the family. Hiding with her husband in Hitler's secret refuge in the days of the fateful defeat, she made the decision to end her life alongside the two men who had left a deep mark on her existence, her husband and the Führer. When German failure seemed inevitable, in the bunker where they awaited the imminent outcome, Magda confessed to Trottel Junge, the Chancellor's personal secretary, some shocking words that would remain recorded in history. Oh, it is better that my children die than that they live in shame and disgrace. Our children have no place in a Germany like the one that will come after the war. On May 1, 1945, after repeatedly rejecting the opportunity to escape with her children, Magda Goebbels made a chilling decision. Her pessimistic and cruel outlook on her future convinced her to prepare her six children, five girls, and one boy for death. She and her husband instructed the SS dentist, Helmut Kunz, to administer morphine to the children to put them to sleep so they could insert a vial of cyanide between their teeth. Magda herself took it upon herself to make them swallow the poison, ending her young lives and becoming a Nazi mother par excellence, devoted and murderous. Then, she ingested the same deadly cyanide she had used to poison the children, while Joseph Goebbels shot himself in the head, exchanging the last look with his wife. With that bloody and inexplicable act, the offspring of Joseph Goebbels ended. However, Magda did manage to leave a seat on this earth, Harold Quant, son of her first marriage to billionaire Gunther Quant. This young man, impregnated with Nazi fever from his mother, joined the German army and rose to lieutenant in the Luftwaffe. He was captured by the Allies in Italy near the end of the war. After his release in 1947, Harold resumed his life as a civilian with the support of his paternal family, although marked by his past. He assumed responsibility for the businesses of the Quant Group, one of the largest business empires in West Germany, ranging from the textile and pharmaceutical industries to the BMW brand. 
His life came to an end in 1967 in a tragic airplane accident. His four daughters, also descendants of Magda Goebbels, inherited an impressive fortune, carrying with them their family's complex legacy into post-war history. First story that we will learn next is that of Philippe Sens, a prominent lawyer and writer. This man decided to make a documentary film that would address the different perspectives held by relatives of relatives who served in the Third Reich. My Nazi Legacy, the title of the film released in 2015, delves into the complex and emotional terrain of the children of two prominent Nazi leaders. The filmmaker begins a journey with two men whose fathers played key roles in Adolf Hitler's regime. On the one hand, there is Nicholas Frank, son of Hans Frank, the governor general of occupied Poland during World War II, who faithfully accompanied the Fuhrer's final solution. On the other, we find Horst von Vector, son of Otto von Vector, senior Nazi official and governor of Galicia, a Nazi as fanatical as Frank Sr. As the narrative unfolds, the documentary offers an intimate look through deep conversations and revealing encounters. Nicholas Frank, with a direct confrontation attitude, condemns his father's war crimes. The German, without any hesitation, maintains that his father should have been sentenced to hanging for his atrocities. His position is clear. The truth must prevail over the filial relationship. On the other hand, Horst von Wechter is torn between loyalty and love for the memory of his father and the difficult acceptance of the uncomfortable truth surrounding Otto von Wechter's actions. Plus, let's listen to Nicholas talking about his father and the Germans. I wrote a book against my father called The Father of Revenge. I wrote it because of the silence in Germany. The Germans built a lot of monuments for their victims, yes, because it was politically correct. But the silent majority of the Germans never acknowledged the crimes between 33 and 45, which the Germans committed. I think we are people without empathy. The film not only delves into the personal lives of these men, but raises profound questions about responsibility and the inheritance of a dark past. What are the complexities of reconciling family legacy with historical truth? It is still interesting that two children, in a very similar position, have such conflicting positions. One, capable of condemning his own father to hanging, while the other, defends his ideals and beliefs, despite being conflicted by the sinister methodologies applied to achieve that end. Although the conclusion seems simple, we are talking about how a son relates to a father who was a war criminal and who committed and endorsed mass murders, racial exterminations, and looting of defenseless communities. Hermann Goering, colossal figure of the Third Reich and prominent leader of the Nazi party, wove a dark legacy as commander of the German Luftwaffe during World War II. Appointed successor to Adolf Hitler, his fanatical devotion to the regime marked him as a bloodthirsty figure. After the war in Nuremberg, he was tried in the trial for war crimes and crimes against humanity. When he was informed of his conviction, he chose the way out of cowardice. The night before he was to face his sentence by hanging, he took cyanide, ending his life and fleeing his fate. Etta Goering, born June 2, 1938, was the only daughter of Hermann Goering and his second wife, the actress Emmy Sonnemann. The fact that she was Hitler's goddaughter practically turned her into a princess of the Third Reich. From her birth, Ella Etta was a national celebrity, growing up on the opulent Karen Hall estate, filled with valuable works of art and a children's play palace. Her godfather inspired national celebrations in honor of her birthday. Etta's life, ostensibly a fairy tale, was overshadowed by the dark legacy of her father. Throughout her life, she Etta defended the heritage of her father, battling against social condemnation of a family history that indelibly marked an entire nation. Her death on December 21, 2018 at the age of 80 was not publicly disclosed by her relatives because they did not want to suffer punishment from society. Whenever a Nazi loses his life, there is a part of the European people that feels a little relief inside, 
There was an even more unseemly curiosity for Etta Goering. She was buried discreetly in Munich in an unmarked grave, a choice motivated by the dark weight of her paternal inheritance. Rolf Mengele, son of the sadistic Nazi doctor Josef Mengele, always saw himself as an ordinary child. Although his destiny led him to be born in Germany in 1944, during the last days of Nazism, in his childhood, this seemed to be just a curious fact. At the age of 10, he was enjoying a happy life in Germany and received sporadic letters from who he assumed was his uncle Fritz. Since he had never met his father, whose mother told him that he was a hero missing in action, Rolf developed a deep affection for his uncle. It wasn't until he was 12 in 1956 when two shocking revelations shook his world. The first was that, contrary to what he thought, his real father was Josef Mengele, responsible for cruel scientific experiments on prisoners at Auschwitz. The second piece of news was that Fritz's uncle, to whom he had written countless letters, was actually Mengele himself. With the truth exposed, the cruelty of his schoolmates was unleashed, who showed no mercy and hurled insults at him such as, your father is a criminal, little Nazi, or SS Mengele. Once aware of the true identity of his father, Rolf experienced Joseph's attempts to rebuild a father-son relationship with him. However, time and ideological differences had irreparably distanced them. Despite this, Rolf agreed to have one last meeting with his father in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where the Nazi doctor was exiled. There, he witnessed the decline of his mother. The proud SS assassin had become a fearful old man, obsessed with hiding to avoid being condemned. Although Rolf demanded explanations about the Holocaust, he only got evasive answers. Let's listen to the bloodthirsty scientist's own son tell it in the first person. Here, he, as I told you, he, he exploded hearing this as a question from thy son to him. In the sense, how can you imagine that this is possible for me to do these things? Don't you see at the first line this is a, a lie or propaganda or, or I don't know why? Rolf Mengele always carried the shame of two atrocities endorsed by his father, the murders and the bloody medical experiments carried out in the Auschwitz concentration camp. The story of Mengele's clinical trials with prisoners is truly terrifying. For purely illustrative purposes, we tell you that the Nazi researcher had focused his obsession on studying twins, multiplying the study possibilities in the event of the death of one of them. After the death of his father in 1979, Rolf Mengele lived in silence by order of the family clan who were the last living relatives of the macabre researcher. But that was until 1985. That year, the boy decided to share his story with the press, assuming the cost of permanently breaking the relationship with his paternal side of the family. With a clear conscience, he changed his surname to Jenkel so that his children would not carry the weight of his ancestor. He spoke again in 2008 asking for forgiveness from the Jewish community in search of identity and redemption. Martin Bormann was Hitler's private secretary and head of the chancellery. He was one of the Fuhrer's seconds in command, an extremely trusted man. So much so that his firstborn, with the same name as his father, was Hitler's godson, and they privately joked that he was one of the possible aspirants to the throne of the Third Reich once he was older, and the Nazis will dominate the earth. In the tumultuous years of his youth, Martin Bormann was a rebellious and elusive boy. Convinced that his son needed to be tamed, his parents sent him to a Nazi boarding school feared even by parents of young people affiliated with Nazism. On the shores of Lake Starnberg in Bavaria, this educational bastion was built with the mission of forging the future leaders of the Reich through uncompromising war discipline paramilitary training, and challenging physical training. Memorizing the Hitler Youth Program and poring over the Führer's Mein Kampf were daily rituals. After the war, at just 15 years old, Martin returned to his home, dressed in his uniform with the swastika marking his arm. The house was completely empty and uninhabited, 
His mother had run away with a false last name, while his father had disappeared without a trace. Abandoned and helpless, Martin ran into a pastor who took him in, awakening in him a religious vocation. He embraced the life of priest and teacher, moving away from the shadows of his past. However, in 2011, darkness returned to his life when he was accused of mistreatment and sexual abuse of students. Hiding behind an alleged senile dementia, he evaded trial and conviction. Finally, on March 11, 2013, Martin Alfred Bormann, who was a claimant to the throne of the Third Reich, found his last breath unpunished, as did his father. While it is true that children are not responsible for the actions of their parents, many of the figures we explore in today's chapter claimed responsibility for the sinister actions of their parents. It is for this reason that memory and awareness of the atrocities that occurred are exercises that Germans are forced to carry out daily so that Nazi ideology does not reign again on European soil. In this way, we are finishing today's impressive video. We thank you for reaching the end, and we look forward to seeing you in the next installments of Military History.